Good morning, everyone. Uh, we continue our six part series on the book Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And uh, this week we're looking at kind of our little personal lives together, uh, how we live our every day and uh, how we do it as Christians. So these two texts uh, that I'm about to read uh, reflect a good portion of what we're going to talk about here today. Psalm 57 Awake, my soul, awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness extends to the clouds. And then from the New Testament, Colossians, the third chapter. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, Father, through him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's, let's pray. Well, Lord, a new day has dawned, and it is your day, and it's an Easter day. So may our lives reflect that we are indeed risen with you. And may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be accepted in your sight and in your hearing. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, chapter two. Uh, Jen, why don't you uh, kind of create a context for that chapter, and then we can uh, help people kind of see why you've chosen these two texts here. Yes. Chapter two of Life Together is all about what we do together as a community, um, what kind of rituals we use. Uh, especially when it comes to worship and the ways that together as a community, we strengthen and enrich our faith um, through these different types of worship um, components or uh, rituals. And so it's song, prayer, scripture, gathering, all of these important things. And so I picked out a couple of scriptures that focused on music, and corporate singing and um, how important that is to, um, to a congregation and a community of faith. And then also I just love Colossians 3 and its positive um, description of a community and the ways that we bless and enrich one another and um, really like verse 16 especially, that the mm -hmm. word of Christ dwell in you, uh, teach and admonish one another and wisdom and be thankful um, and sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. Mm. All right, where you want to go? I uh, well, let me let me just throw you each a softball here. Uh, Bonhoeffer was uh, um, convinced that the Psalms is indeed the prayer book of the Christian community, and that it's something that needs to be prayed and spoken and heard and read amongst the Christian community often. Mm -hmm. uh, your thoughts on that? Well, um, my, my first thought would be one of the things that we often say as we begin our prayers um, with the psalm every Sunday, we often do say that. We often say that um, the book of Psalms is the prayer book of um, our Jewish sisters and brothers and the prayer book of the church. Um, and <clears throat> And has been for many centuries. Um, the the most helpful thing in, in Bonhoeffer's um, in this second chapter that for me I was going through a lot of what he was writing, just finding a hard time getting a foothold in some of it. Um, it it seemed kind of you know off here and esoteric. And then I read this sentence where he said. Um, here we learn first what prayer means, and meaning reading the Psalms. It means praying according to the word of God on the basis of promises. Then he says, even if a verse or a psalm is not one's own prayer, it is nevertheless the prayer of another member of the fellowship, 
So it's quite certainly the prayer of the true man, Jesus Christ, and his body on earth. That really helped me because there are some Psalms um, that I really struggle with. Yeah. Um, and, and to hear that, you know, even though this is not my prayer, this is a prayer that, that someone who is, is part of the community of faith prays. Yeah. For me, that was very, very helpful to read. Yesterday I, I was, uh, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Jen. I was just going to say that I've seen over and over again through my time in ministry that the Psalms are often a place where people can really connect personally with scripture and find words that they were looking for to express how they feel, especially, um, is it Psalm 88 that is the really dark one that that does not end with a happy ending it, it's it it ends with sadness and um and, and i remember in particular one man who i introduced him to psalm 88 and he said this is what i needed i needed a place in scripture where there was not a happy ending and that i could be totally myself because i'm just not feeling hopeful right now mm -hmm. um and to me, that was really powerful. Um, so I've seen those connections with the Psalms many times. What struck me too in that second chapter was uh, Bonhoeffer believed that as we uh, read and proclaim uh, the Psalms, Christ also does the same. Christ continues to uh, speak these words to the church and then the church becomes the voice to the world of these Psalms. But I. So I was with Ethel Haugen yesterday. Be, she's going to be making a move soon. And I was over there and brought communion. I read to her Psalm 139. And I said, Ethel, uh, I'm going to include Bonhoeffer's thought here that we're not going to just read this together, but Christ is reading it along with us. And all, her, her face lit up in a different kind of way to put that kind of magnitude on it. I thought uh, brought some great importance and also just kind of brought the whole Christian Church on Earth together for me there. So I, I appreciate what Bonhoeffer has uh, helped me see it that I did not see before. Yeah, I, th I think to be reminded that this was Jesus' prayer book. You know, yeah. these were the prayers that Jesus prayed, you know, uh, along with, you know, other Jewish believers of the time. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I know last week, we didn't, in, in our sermon or whatever you want to call it. Um, we didn't talk a lot about the, the oil running over Aaron's beard and down onto the collars of his robe. Um, and, and I think I'm, I'm finding a little more foothold in our readings um, for this coming week and, and not just the thoughts of Bonhoeffer. Um, this, the second chapter is the day with others. And I think about, you know, how he talks about how we as Christians begin the day. And I really like these readings that the first thing we do as Christians, is, as people, is, is wake up from sleep. Um, you know, so Psalm 57, awake my soul, you know. Um, and then Colossians, the second thing we do after we wake up is usually get dressed. So how does the Christian, you know, get dressed? What do we clothe ourselves in when we wake from sleep? Uh, I, I find I find those thoughts really um, helpful with these scripture passages in a way that um, last week's scripture just didn't grab me. I appreciated last Sunday, Steve, when you talked about how the old Adam shows up overnight <laughs> and how you wake up um, and you need that, um, you need to remember your baptism and, and in the morning. And um, I thought that was a really nice reference to this idea of that the daily renewal of God's love and forgiveness for us. And I like the way that Luther puts it. it it's much more confrontative that we don't remember a baptism. We drown the old Adam in the waters of baptism. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's much more... Um, well, I mean, it's Luther, it's much more kind of combative, you know, reactionary, you know, hands on thing than just remembering my baptism, you know, it's, it's you know, grabbing that old Adam and, you know, 
holding him under the waters of baptism until he blows big bubbles, you know. Yeah, I think especially in this Easter season, this fits well. Uh, you know, we we have this big grand Easter Sunday worship, and then it kind of fades away as we've come to know. Uh, and it's too bad because, I mean, I, I, you'd like to proclaim again, Christ is risen. Every Sunday, Christ is risen. I think Bonhoeffer is telling us uh, that that's how you begin the day. That's how you begin worship. That's what the Christian community has to live by every day. Yes. That death has been defeated. Death mm -hmm. has died. And we are now alive in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me or dwells richly in me, even through the word. So um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I guess, where we want to go with this on Sunday. Are you too, uh, you want to use the same format or you want me to, I can fly alone too, either way. I like the format. And, and I talked to other people and what I heard, um, and, and please tell us too, Jen, what you heard. What I heard is that it worked for people. Good. I did too. I heard from more than one person um, and people of different ages that they all um, enjoyed it. So we can keep trying it. And if it gets to the point where it gets stale, um, maybe we'll want to rethink it. But um, I enjoyed it too. I thought it was really fun to a new challenge for me because I come from a place where I didn't, I didn't have clergy partners on staff. So to do a, a communal sermon like that was a brand new experience and, and really fun. I think uh, in this chapter also, I was I kind of surprised that he was talking about, you know, our work, our work day, and how we, we ought to approach work in a different kind of way than, yeah, I got to go to work today. But he, he talks about it in terms of it's a gift of God, that God allows us to go out and be part of this working community and, um, you know, I, I, I guess I appreciate that a little bit. I did find him, though, just a little bit lofty sometimes. So I think he wants, I mean, if you could have all the time in the world, you know, you could start your morning, then at noon you do something, and then in the evening you do another thing, and you gather the family around and around the meal and all of them. And um, he had a lot of time to think, I guess, there in prison and was probably <laughs> enjoying a different lifestyle, too. But it doesn't always work. But I'm trying to think of how we can help our everyday family right now kind of figure out how to live a more devotional disciplined christian life um and so i'm i'm hoping that we can make that the focus of our sunday as it becomes very practical uh, mm -hmm. i heard the council president even say that she was trying to figure out how to have a more you know a, i don't even know a, a spirit-filled life or morning or devotional whatever and mm -hmm. i think maybe we can help some people uh you know, put some crutches under them and help them walk in that direction. One, I think that's a great idea. And that's actually, as you were beginning to talk about that, that's where my mind went. And two, I just sent along to Becky today uh, a link to a devotional for her to take a look at and consider. Um, because what she had said is that if she can start every morning with um, CNN's five things having to do with what's going on in the news, she could certainly start every morning with a, a devotional to help her as she, um, you know, as, as God engages with her throughout the day. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's a great idea to, at least in part, organize our reflection this coming Sunday on, you know, so for those of us who live in this day and this age with what's going on, how can our day with others look as um, as followers of Christ? Yeah, and what difference does it make? The other piece that I would talk about maybe is just what does it mean to worship? Mm -hmm. You know, when we get together, you know, we, we, as I was saying earlier, make a distinction between we're going to church or are we going to worship? Because I remember I even titled a sermon once, Don't Go to Church. Uh, uh, because you don't go to church. You, you live being the church, the community. Worship is a part of being a community of believers together, but um, maybe again, in a practical kind of way, help our parishioners figure out what it is to worship, why we come to worship, what's the importance of worship, what are we meaning to, to do in worship? And what is the difference between worshiping and attending worship, yeah. which I yeah. think are two very different things. 
And he also emphasizes in that second chapter, the table. And I can't say enough about that table where people can come and taste again, uh, the goodness and grace of God. So, yeah, I think we're good. Hey, so, looking forward uh, to it. all right, we'll leave it kind of as a, an O. Henry short story, uh, mystery ending there to how this is all going to turn out. Okay. God bless everyone. That's good. <laughs>